like the fourth uh, checklist item is um, we're actually going to be recording this brief because we had a lot of civilians who actually aren't able to leave their work centers due to the mission um, to come in and do it. So we're actually going to record it so that way in the future if folks are trying to come in to come to the brief and they can't, I can at least send them this link. So that being said, I said, I know I said don't hold your questions to the end, but if you have a very, 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 very personal question, hold that one to the end. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, awesome. And then um, I'm also going to hand out real quickly these workshop evaluations. Um, if you have a really specific question that you'd like for me to reach back to you on to answer, at the very bottom of this, there's going to be the option for you to give me some actual, like, you could be like, really give me some feedback. You can also write your question, though, and give me your contact information, and I can reach out to you um, either by phone or by email to get that answered. And I'm sorry, one more thing. Our printer's broken. I normally print these slides for everyone because it's a lot of information. So if you gave me your email when you uh, hit the sign-in sheet when you came in, I'll get those emailed out to you guys tomorrow. That way you'll have all the information. And I think that's kind of all my housekeeping items. I'm sorry. I know that was, that was a lot. Anybody have any questions before we jump into everything? Yes. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So I'm really excited that we're generating a lot of um, excitement and a lot of interest in the TSP. Uh, when we're talking about financial planning, TSP is really important because what's the biggest long-term goal that we all have? Retirement. Retirement. Yeah, absolutely, right? Um, so when we're talking about getting prepared for retirement, there's actually three investment platforms. I really want to discourage everybody in this room from hiding money in their mattress or like burying it in the back backyard. Uh, the reason being is that what happens with inflation? Right? So if I have five dollars today and I have that same five dollar bill in 30 years, what's happened to the purchasing power of that five dollars? It's probably decreased, right? So I really want to encourage everyone to make sure that you're using the right financial platform to meet your financial goals. So when we're talking about retirement, there's going to be three platforms for investing. So the first is the TSP, and the TSP is my favorite platform, and I'm going to give you all the reasons why in a couple slides. The second platform that you might be familiar with is a 401k, and a 401k is a totally civilian version. So that might be if you work for like Verizon or Boeing or any of those companies before you came into civil service. Does anyone know what the third platform is? It has three letters. Well, that's so Social Security is part of retirement, but this one is First. an investment, an IRA. So the third platform that you might have is going to be an IRA, and I will say my military members love their IRAs, and I don't know why. I'm, I'll talk about that a little bit further, too. Um, so an IRA is totally private. This is not linked with an employer. Um, so I will say, if you have a stay-at-home spouse, they're not able to have a TSP or 401k, but what can they have? An IRA. An IRA, right? So um, if you're in school full-time, but you're working part-time, what could you have? An IRA. an IRA, right? So there are some options of an IRA is a really good platform. It's not my favorite, though, out of the three because it's going to have higher operating costs, which we'll talk about a little bit further. So I know we got a couple military folks in this room. For the most part, though, when we're talking about being prepped for retirement, there's two things. We've got the defined benefit plan, right? So this is going to be whatever your retirement pay is going to be. So maybe it's 20%, maybe it's going to be 50%. You're not in control of this other than doing your years of service, right? It's the government's responsibility or your employer to make sure that this funding is going to be available. And essentially, once you've met the criteria, whether it's years of service or an age requirement, you'll get this check every single month until the day you die, right? Whoop, whoop. That's pretty reliable income. Second thing is going to be the defined contribution plan, and you have total control over this. You know sometimes when people are stressed, and they'll sit you down and they'll say, Beth, what's your circle of influence versus your circle of control? You know what I'm talking about? This is going to be within that circle of control. So you're going to decide how much do you want to put into that each year, and then where do you actually want that money to go when we're talking about the investments. So I'm going to get out of the way in case anybody wants to take a picture of this. Also, remember, I'm going to email these to you, so it's going to have all these formulas. So most of the military folks sitting in the room, you're either going to be in the old retirement system, the legacy or the high three, with that 2.5% multiplier for your retirement pay, or the blended retirement system, which has the 2.0%. What's the biggest, other than a half of a percentage point, what's the biggest difference between these two systems? <coughs> oh, I'm so glad you're here. So the blended retirement system is very similar. 
similar to a civilian retirement plan where the government is actually going to give you a matching component to your TSP. So very similar. Is anybody in the CSRS? Oh, you've been around a long time. I bet you've got a lot of wisdom you could share with us for federal <laughs> employment. <laughs> so CSRS, the uh, formula is going to get a little bit more complicated. Once you're in the FERS system, though, so most of us in this room are probably in the FERS. It's that 1% times your years of service times the, the average 36 months that you had the highest base pay, base pay, okay? Now, if you're in the blended retirement system or if you're in FERS, you're probably here because you want to learn more about the TSP because we have a matching component. That's exciting, right? A matching component is, in every essence, free money. So how much should I, if I have all my high interest level debt paid off, what percentage should I be contributing to my TSP? As much as you can. Right? So as much as I can is, is 100 percent the right answer. But kind of if I have to put a minimum baseline, I hope that you're doing at least five percent. Why is that? That's the matching. That's the matching, right? So if I'm in the military in the blended retirement system, or if I'm a civilian in the first system, and I don't have any high interest level debt, and I'm only putting in three percent, oh, I'm losing sleep at night over it all. You're missing out on free money, okay? And we're going to talk about that a little bit further. So why do you need to invest for retirement? So uh, I'm not incredibly athletic, so for those of you who are, I'm taking you out of this question. But think of a three-legged stool. Think of a two-legged stool first. If I have my Social Security and my retirement pay, would anybody sit on a stool that was like this? I would not, and I'm not athletic. I need a third leg to come into that stool maybe even a fourth leg to come into that stool, right? So the third leg that I'm gonna have come into that stool is gonna be, be either be my TSP or my 401k, and maybe you need another leg coming in. So um, maybe you're gonna work part-time in retirement, maybe you're gonna have an IRA, maybe you're gonna have rental property, right? Whatever it has, but essentially, this is what's gonna get you until the end. Now, I don't wanna talk politics, but do you think that Social Security is gonna be around when you retire? And is that something that you want to bet on in essence, right? So depending on how reliable you think Social Security is going to be when you're of Social Security age, you might need to contribute more to your TSP than somebody who is already collecting Social Security probably needed to do in years back. Does that make sense? Awesome. So why does Beth love the TSP? So first off, you get up to that 5% agency match if you're in FERS or in the blended retirement system. Whoop, whoop, free money, everyone loves that, right? Second reason why I love it is you've got a lot of broadly diversified investment funds. That's probably why most of you are here today, and that's the bulk of what we're gonna talk about today is gonna be those broadly, uh, those broadly diversified investment funds. You also have the life cycle target funds, which make it very, very easy for, for you to pick a fund that matches your risk tolerance and then never look at it again. You can also do traditional or Roth, which we're going to talk about that too. So which one is going to be most advantageous for you tax-wise? This is a big thing, the automatic enrollment and payroll deduction. Research shows we do not miss money that we don't see, right? Why do you think they take out our taxes and our health insurance and things like that before we see it in our bank account, right? Because we don't think of it as a bill. <clears throat> so this is awesome. So for those of you who are in the military, New accessions, one January of 2018 or later, those folks are automatically coming in contributing 3% to a traditional TSP. Civilian new hires, you are also doing 3% automatically to a traditional TSP. If you're taking notes, I want you to jot that down because when we talk about traditional versus Roth, you might want to change that. And within the next year or two, you might have a new coworker come on board. And if you're having water cooler talk, you might want to tell them that they're doing 3% traditional. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, oh, here's something really cool. Anybody uh, get the newsletter from TSP with their end of, end of year statement? Anybody read it? Any, so come October of 2020, all the new hires are going to automatically be contributing 5% tsp which i think is awesome right um i work with uh, f packers this is airman it's their first duty station i say congratulations you're investing and they look at me like deer in a headlights they don't even know that they've got that three percent going in so i think that's going to be a really really awesome change this is my favorite reason why i really love the tsp it has the lowest operating expenses that are out there so the tsp is only costing me 40 cents per thousand dollars it's a heck of a deal. I don't think you could find anything cheaper out there. On average, a 
401k is going to be about five or six bucks per thousand in fees. And an IRA, remember, there's no employer link to it. So that's going to be about nine dollars in operating costs. You can also keep your TSP for life. Did y'all know that? There's a big misconception. A lot of times people are like, oh, I'm getting out in a couple of years. No, as long as you've got $200 in your TSP, you can keep it for life. And here's the thing. Did you know that you can roll over your old 401k into your TSP? Why would I want to do that? Low, low income expenses. Heck yeah. So um, I used to be in property management before I got my job here a couple of years ago. And my 401k was with a company called Fidelity. I rolled that sucker over because I had it in a fund that was tracking the S&P 500, which I can also get in the TSP, which if you don't know I'm talking about, glad you're here, that's coming up in a couple slides. And I'm paying 40 cents per thousand dollars on my operating costs compared to six dollars. So that, that was very exciting. And then here's another benefit of the TSP. The G Fund has a 0% chance for loss. Now I was hesitating on putting this on the benefit slide because when I'm 70 years old, the G Fund is a very attractive, uh, very attractive investment, right? Because if this is my main source of income and there's no chance for loss, it's looking good. Anybody know what the average return rate is of the G Fund? Not much. It's not much. I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it was like 2.3% for 2019. What's inflation? About two to three percent, right? So military members, if you are in the high three, your money is automatically going into the G fund. I can't tell you how many grown men I have almost in tears in my office because they've had their money in the G fund for 20 plus years. It's still money in an investment, which is good. It's better than being in debt. But last year, the life cycle 2050 fund had like a 24% return rate. That hurts my heart, right? You just missed out on a lot of money. So it's really important that you know what your risk tolerance is and you know where your money is. But overall, the G Fund is gonna be a benefit of the TSP. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip this just for the sake of time. But this is really important to know. How much can I contribute in 2020 to my TSP? Yes, 19 and a half. That's a lot of money, right? Now here's something really exciting. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand and identify, but for those of you who are 50 years or older or turning 50 this calendar year, I've got a really exciting option for you. You're eligible for catch-up contributions. So you can put in an additional $6,500. Here's something else really cool. I love going to pre-deployment briefs and I hope everyone's going to combat zone. Anybody know why? Tax-free pay. Tax -free pay, heck yeah. <laughs> Right? So maybe you've got another four to $500 per month that's gonna be in your paycheck. Use it to pay off debt, or you can bump up your TSP contribution, right? So if you're in a combat zone, you can actually put up to $56,000 per year into your TSP. I've been here four years. I haven't seen anybody be able to max that out. I haven't seen anyone though really on longer than like a six to seven month deployment. If you've maxed this out, please talk to me. I wanna know your secret. That way I can, I can share it with everyone else, okay? Now here's something to think about. Remember that 5% government match? I do not want you to max that out before the end of December, this 19 and a half. Does anybody know why? Because you lose the matching if you, if you go to that limit. Absolutely, so let's say to max out the 19 and a half, I would need to put in 8% January through December. But maybe you leave here today and you're like, whew, I caught best energy, I've got the TSP bug, I am hyped, and I am going to put in 12%. Well, 12% would have you maxing, you're making a lot of money in this example, but 12% would have you maxing out this 19 and a half come October. And what just happened is you just missed out on 5% in November and 5% in December. So make sure if you are planning on maxing out this 19 and a half, do it in December. Y'all tracking with me on that? Awesome, awesome. Alrighty, so traditional versus Roth. When do you wanna pay taxes on this? So I've got, a, I'm kind of a numbers girl, so I've got an example I wanna show you guys. So if I put $10,000 into my TSP for 2020, if this money grows for 40 years, and let's say I get a 7% return rate, in 2060, does anybody know what that $10,000 will have grown to? It's really tough math, I, I do it on a calculator, but it's gonna be just shy of $150,000. That's a pretty good return, huh? 
Now keep in mind it had 40 years, compound interest. That's why that number is so large. I have a question. Do you want to pay taxes on 10,000 or 150? Now, this is a general blanket statement. Do not apply this blindly to your life. But if you want to pay taxes on the 10, that's going to be a Roth TSP. You're going to go ahead and pay the taxes now at your current tax bracket as the money goes <coughs> into it. And then when we're in our 60s or 70s and I'm withdrawing it, I do not pay taxes on the earnings. As a general blanket statement, a Roth TSP is typically going to be the most advantageous, especially for military members. Because military members, your base pay is going to be your only taxable income. BAH and BAS go straight to your pocket untaxed. Now, I know most of the folks in this room are civilians. So I'm a GS-11. I'm not married. I file my taxes on my own. I'm federally at a 22% tax bracket. 10, 12, 22, and it goes up from there. <clears throat> the chances are, at this stage in life, I probably am not going to be in that much lower of a tax bracket when I'm in my 60s, right? So for me, I'm 28 years old at a 22% tax bracket. It's most advantageous for me to pay taxes now on the $10,000, right? Because for me, my money's gonna grow for 30 years tax-free. Anybody, do y'all know what dinks are? Dual income, no kids. Yes, oh, I love working with dinks. Yeah, dual income with no kids. You got a lot of money coming in, right? What are you also paying a lot of? Taxes, right? I didn't know, but apparently kids, you get a really good tax write off of them, right? So, let's say I get married next year and um, I marry a civilian, right? Two civilians, all of our pay is taxable income. At that point, maybe we're in like a 38, 34% tax bracket, right? At that point, maybe I wanna switch over to do a traditional TSP. So a traditional TSP lowers my taxable income. So if I do a traditional TSP, I have $10,000 less of taxable income, and then I will pay taxes on the 150 or however much it is I withdraw for that year when I'm in my 60s or my 70s at whatever tax bracket I'm in in my 60s or 70s. I know that was a lot of numbers and a lot of scenarios. Did I lose anybody on that? Because that's a really important method to, to have a good understanding of. So here's something I want for you to think about. If, if I'm coming in automatically contributing 3% to a traditional TSP or 5% come October, is that most advantageous for me? For me personally, no. But remember how I had you write down 3% traditional? This was really good water cooler talk, right? Right. So make sure that you're talking to folks. Now again, this is a general blanket statement. That's the thing with financial counseling. I cannot tell you black and white that one thing is best for all of us because it's really gonna depend on your situation. But at least make sure they know the difference between traditional and Roth. And if they still have questions, where can they go to get those answered? Me. Beth Snodgrass, look me up in Global, I'll get them taken care of, good deal. Now, I hear this rumor. Beth, if I put my money into Roth, I'm not gonna get the government match. True or false? 100% false. The government doesn't care where you put your money. You get to take if you want for it to go traditional or Roth. They just care what percentage are you doing. So I have my 5% going Roth. However, the government match is always gonna go traditional, okay? It's still free money. Right, I don't really care when I pay taxes on free money. I'm just really appreciative to have it, okay? So keep all that in mind. All right, so let's jump on ahead. So this says TSP in the BRS, but this is also TSP in FERS. So this is what the matching component looks like. So if I put in zero dollars, the government automatically gives me 1%. Now let me pause. Blended retirement, you have to serve for two years to be vested. FERS employees, we have to serve three years to be vested. What does that mean when I say to be vested? No, you get your money out. So the money I put in the TSP is always mine, but in order to be able to keep the government matching. So once I'm vested, if, if I put in zero, the government gives me one. If I put in one, they match it. Two, they match it. Three, they match it. Here's where it's getting goofy though. So if I put in four, they match it half. If I put in five, they match it another half. So that's why essentially, in case you ever hear me throwing around, hey, if you put in 5%, you're really getting 10%, right? That's kind of how that, how that math works out. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this automatic enrollment. 
Okay, let's talk about long-term investing. Anybody in here like to play the stock market or trying to get rich quick? None? Good, usually that person is like, fight me on the next two slides. <laughs> so the concept of day trading or like a midterm level investment, right, money I'm gonna wanna use in the next seven years, that mentality is completely different than my retirement investment, okay? Here's the first thing you have to make sure you have taken care of. If I have a credit card with a $3,000 balance or a $30,000 balance at an 18% interest rate, should I contribute to my TSP or get that sucker paid off? So first things first, before I will even talk investing with you in a one-on-one -on -one appointment, I'm gonna ask you about your debt. Because an 18% interest rate on a credit card, I can't guarantee you're gonna get that 18% interest rate on the TSP, right? So you've gotta get your high interest level debt paid off first. Now, if you have a car loan at 3% interest and uh, you're driving something sensible around, I'm not gonna fight you on that, but I've driven through that dorm parking lot <laughs> and I would be willing to bet if I saw the interest rates that go with those flashy cars, they need to get that paid off before they start contributing to the TSP. So the, also, the other thing you need to make sure, and I'm sorry, I forgot to say this earlier, the money that you put into a retirement investment, whether it's my TSP, my 401k, or my IRA, I cannot touch this money until I'm 59 and a half. So I wanna make sure that before I get real hyped and I put 30% of my paycheck into my TSP, I need to have a monthly budget set up. My short-term goals, right? Going on vacation, doing a birthday party for my kid, buying Christmas gifts, whatever it might be, that money, oh, car service, people forget to save for that, right? $80 oil change, that hurts. Make sure you're putting that money into your savings account. It's a revolving savings. I'm not expecting for you to have that money at the end of the year. I'm expecting for you to set it aside to then spend it when the need arises. Then think of a midterm level goal, right? So I'm 28. If I wanna buy a house <coughs> in eight years and I wanna have a 20% down payment, that money should not be my TSP, right? Because I will not be 59 and a half in eight years. So build your budget, think about your goals, and make sure that you're using the appropriate investment strategy and the appropriate investment platform. So then at that point, I'm like, okay, well, first thing I want to put in like a bill into my budget is going to be that 5% because I don't want to leave any free money on the table. And then at the end, after I build my budget, you know, if I have a $300 a month surplus, maybe I'll put 50 to eat more sushi, maybe I'll put 100 <coughs> to go on a bigger vacation, and then the rest I might bump up my TSP. Everyone tracking with me on that? Okay, if I take that money out of my TSP before I'm 59 and a half, I'm gonna lose about 30% of it due to early withdrawal penalties and taxes. That's a huge hit. Also, make sure you're minimizing your investment fees. So if I have an IRA that I'm paying $9 per $1,000, in an investment that, if, if it's in something tracking the S&P 500, I can track the S&P 500 and the TSP for 40 cents per thousand dollars. And that's why I don't know why my military members, y'all love your IRAs, but you've got it in the same investment that you could have in the TSP and you're paying like 900 times the cost for it, okay? And then I also wanna make sure that you're balancing your risk with your returns. So the biggest predictor of my risk tolerance is gonna be my age. And, and this is even for a midterm level investment, right? When do I need that money? Because the closer I get towards needing that money, the more conservative I want to be with my account. So I'm 28, I probably wanna have most of my money in stocks because that's gonna give me the biggest return. If the stock market crashes tomorrow, I am not losing any sleep over my retirement fund. How come? You got time to rebuild. I've got so much time to rebuild. Now my dad's 58. Do you think he's gonna be stressed if he has all his money in stocks mm -hmm. and the stock market crashes tomorrow? Yeah, he's not retiring at age 62, is he? He might have to, have to keep punching that time card for a little bit longer. So the closer I get to my retirement age, I slowly want to shift my investment to go from stocks to what? Begins with bonds. a B? Bonds, right? Yep, so I'm gonna switch that to bonds, okay? This is why I love the TSP. <clears throat> Research shows that the best way to mitigate my risk is I want to put my eggs in every basket. So I want to put some in stocks, some in bonds, large companies, small companies, U.S. and international. Guess what? You can do that in the TSP. I'm going to show you why. 
So within the TSP, these are the five indexes that I can put my money in. G, F, C, S, and I. So I talk about the G fund, right? So the G fund is technically called a non-traded U.S. Treasury security, and there's nothing like it in a 401k or an IRA. Zero percent chance for loss, but the less risk, the less return, potential for return, right? Now the F fund, this is going to track the Barclays Capital. You can also have your money in an IRA tracking the Barclays Capital. Which one is giving me the most bang for my buck in regards to fees? The TSP, right? So the Barclays Capital, these are bonds that are made up of the U.S. stock market. And it's, I'm sorry, the U.S. companies. They're it's not stocks. They're bonds, U.S. companies. There's over 9,700 companies that make up the Barclays Capital, which is awesome. That's giving me a lot of diversification, right? If one of them goes out of business, I'm not batting an eye because there's 9,699 other companies to keep that afloat, right? So again, G and F are bonds, less risk. If I'm 70 years old, I probably am going to have most of my money here. C, S, and I, these are going to be my stocks. Now, 2019 was a heck of a year for the stock market. So if you have most of your money in CSNI, you probably think the TSP is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But I'll tell you, the stock market goes up and it does what? It goes down. It goes down too, okay? 2018, the last quarter of 2018, terrible for the stock market, okay? 2008, terrible for the stock market, right? So the C fund is going to track the S&P 500. And this is a huge index. I guarantee you, look to see what your investment is in your IRA. Probably half of you who have IRAs have it in the S&P 500, okay? This is made up of over 500 large publicly traded US-based companies. The S fund is gonna track the Dow Jones and these are gonna be your small to medium US-based companies. Between these two, you hit about 95% of the US stock market. And that's good. I don't wanna hit 100% because that other five-ish percent it's gonna be those startup companies, the penny stocks, right? If I'm trying to get rich quick, maybe that's what I wanna do, but this is a long-term investment strategy, right? <clears throat> now the I fund. The I fund is an international fund, and right now it carries a lot of risk. It's made up of 923 companies, mainly in Europe and Asia. The value of the dollar impacts the Euro, and what's happening in Europe also impacts the Euro, right? So right now, sometimes the I fund's at the top, Sometimes it's at the bottom, sometimes it's at the top, so on and so forth. Throughout calendar year 2020, they, are, they the TSP board, they are adding diversification to the I fund. So it's going to expand to include more companies. It's gonna include a lot of companies in Canada and it's gonna bring a lot more stability to it. It has not happened yet. They talked about it briefly in the newsletter, but that should roll out sometime this calendar year. So let's talk about managing my money. Has anyone ever logged into TSP? Okay, good. If you're locked out of your account, get with me offline. It can be a little bit of a headache and a little bit of a waiting period. Anybody still waiting on their password? Nope, okay. So I've got two options with the TSP. Option number one, I can log in and I can say, okay, I wanna do 3%, 4%, 32%, 16%, so on and so forth, right? If I do that though, if I set that up when I'm 28 and I never log back in, I'm gonna be having a heart attack when I'm 58 and I'm trying to decide if I can retire, right? I've either made it big or I'm gonna be working until I'm 70, okay? So if you do that, make sure you log in about once per year to rebalance your allocation. So as we get closer and closer to retirement, make it a little bit more conservative, right? Very small shifts. So let's say hypothetically, I have 4% in the G fund and 30% in the C fund for 2020. Next year, I'm gonna have 5% in the G fund, 29% in the C fund. These are very small movements, okay? You're like that. Obviously I'm on board because I'm sitting in an optional financial workshop. You hooked me 10,000 to 150. I want that. I don't wanna manage it. You might really like these life cycles. So financial advisors who work for the TSP took those indexes and built these life cycle funds based on the calendar year that you're gonna retire. So I fall into life cycle 2050. Do you see how most of my money 
is in stocks, but there's still a little bit in bonds to give me some diversification. Here's a really cool thing about the life cycle funds. If I put 100% of my money in it, I can set it and forget it and never look again. Because what happens is on a quarterly basis, these pie charts are gonna rebalance. So as I get closer and closer to this being my main source of income, it's gonna slowly shift. Now, when the TSP does automatic changes, they can do it to like the tenths of the percentage. When I log in to allocate my changes, I cannot do that. I can only do it in, in full one point. But because it does it every quarter, it's like, it, it's such minuscule changes. And what's really cool is look what happens by the time I get to life cycle income. Almost 75% of it's in the G fund, which is very attractive when I'm 70 years old, right? Now, coming out this year, if you read the newsletter like I did, they're coming out with more life cycle funds in five year increments, which is awesome because if you're 36, 35, 36, you fall right in between life cycle 2040 and 2050. So they're coming out with life cycle 2060 and 2065. Now here's something I want for you to keep in mind. You are not pigeonholed based on your year of retirement. So I do fall into life cycle 2050 based on my age, but let's say that I personally have a very, very low risk tolerance, but I wanna use the life cycle funds because I don't wanna to have to worry about logging in each year. What would be my best course of action? <coughs> Putting it, putting it in in like 2030. Absolutely, so if I have a lower risk tolerance, maybe I wanna put it in 2040 or 2030. This works both ways. You might fall into 2030, but have a very high risk tolerance, so maybe you wanna put it in a different one. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions about the indexes or the life cycle funds? Because I think that's typically what people come to learn about. None? I answered all of them on the first go around? Yes, sir. <laughs> life cycle funds because they're actually managing it? That's a great question. There is, it's like pennies though. So the average cost of the TSP is 40 cents per $1,000. Don't quote me on this, I'd have to look at it, but the the actual cost of the G fund is like 0 0.37, 37 cents per 1,000, where the life cycle fund might be like 41 cents, so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's nothing I would lose sleep over, but it does have a very slight difference. So it's still worth it. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, no more? Awesome, y'all are a great crowd. Please come to all my briefs. Sometimes I don't even get through all the slides. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the summary of returns. Now looking at this, I would probably not look at, because you can go on tsp.gov and you can actually look at the day by day returns. I would never do that. This is a 30 to 40 year investment. You will stress yourself out. I don't even really look at it month by month. I think a really good indicator might be the five to 10 years. If you, if you go and look at that, right? So the G fund came around in 1987. The F fund came around at just the beginning of 88. So did C. And then S and I came around in 2001. So if I'm looking at the 10 year returns, the one year return, man, 2019 was a heck of the year for the stock market, right? 31%, almost 28%, 22%. That's awesome. Now here's one thing that you'll find. Stocks and bonds have a negative relationship. So when the stock market is doing great, the interest rates on bonds are lower. Now when I say lower, 2.24, 8.68, that's still pretty high for a bond, right? Now here's something to keep in mind. The average 10 year return rate of the G fund, 2.23%. The average 10 year return rate of the C fund, 13.59% your money is sitting here for 20 years. <sighs> you're breaking my heart, right? That's, that's a really big myth of returns. Now, if you're in the room, you're like, shoot Beth, where were you 20 years ago when I set up my TSP? My money's been in the G fund for 20 years. Don't put all your money in CS and I because you're trying to make up for lost time. That's not a very effective strategy, okay? Now, here's what the life cycle funds look like. So it was a heck of a year for the stock market. So do you see how last year, 2040 and 2050 had a 20.69 and then a 23.33% return, right? That's because these are heavily in stocks. But even looking at the life cycle income fund, 7.6% return, that's pretty good. 2019 was a stellar year for the market, okay? I, I will preface that. But these are important things to know. Now, I will say, um, I went to this really awesome week-long TDY 
for the folks who sit on the board for the TSP were the facilitators, I learned a ton. There are several millionaires within the TSP, which is pretty awesome because the TSP didn't even start until 1987, and that was in the G Fund, right? We really got the bulk of most of our stuff in 2001, and then the Life Cycle Fund started in 2005. I will say your ability to time the market is probably not as good as the professionals. So when in doubt, this is what the TSP advisors told us, when in doubt, the life cycle funds are probably going to do you more good than harm. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is a 10 year, and now I'm sorry, this chart I did uh, borrow from TSP, and um, it, it goes from 2008 through 2017. I did not make my own because this would have taken me a very long time. So sorry, it does not include uh, the past couple of years. But I wanna show you why diversification is really important. So purple is the I fund. Remember I told you that's a little bit of a volatile fund. So 2008, the stock market crashed. Where's the I fund? 42% loss. If you were my <coughs> grandmother and your money was there, that's a really bad year for you. You're getting a part-time job and you are no longer in retirement, right? Well, what happened the next year? 30% return. 8% return, 12% loss, 19% return, 22% return, 5% loss. Do you see though? You never want to be at the top though because where are you eventually? The bottom. The bottom. Look at the yellow fund. So that's one of the life cycle funds that's giving you some diversity. Yeah, I'm never at the top, but where am I also never? At the bottom. Anybody like to run? A couple of us. So I really like to run. I, um, I'm a distance runner though. Um, I hate on my training plan when I have to run sprints. Just that's not how my lungs or my body work. This is a marathon, not a sprint, right? Because if I'm running a marathon and I normally do a 10 minute mile and I take out the first couple of miles and I'm real hyped off of whatever I, you know, pre-workout I took and I do like three seven minute miles, what just happened for the rest of my race? I'm gonna be crawling or carried across that finish line, right? This is a marathon, not a sprint. Steady Eddie wins the game, right? Because, so this is the life cycle 2040 fund. The 10 year return rate is 9.79%. The 10 year return rate of the I fund is 5.85. Who do you wanna be? Life cycle 2040 in this example. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay, awesome. So this talks a little bit about the fees, which I've, I've kind of already talked about, but why do fees truly matter? So if I put my money into a TSP and I have a twin who puts their money into a 401k and we put them in the exact same investment options, the exact same percentages, so on and so forth. After 10 years, I'm gonna have $12,500 more than my twin because of the difference in operating cost. Huh, Beth, 12,500, why does that really matter? Because I have 344,000, that's still a lot. $12,500, I think that's a lot of money. After 30 years, I'm gonna have $115,000 more just because of operating costs. So that's really one of the big reasons I love, love, love the TSP, okay? So let's talk about your account management. I'm gonna let you know front, this is the boring part. This is not what any of you came to learn. This is the most important part, okay? So if you feel like you're falling asleep, if you need to shake or stand up, you will not hurt my feelings. What helps my TSP? First and foremost, if you've got that high interest level debt paid off, contribute at least 5% to take full advantage of the government match. Otherwise, you're literally flushing money down the toilet, which is just absurd, okay? The next best thing that you can do, don't move your money around a lot. Anybody like to drink coffee? Got some fellow coffee lovers, me too. So I'm gonna use an example for you. Let's say that every single day on my way to work, I run by the gas station next to my house and I get a cup of coffee and it's 89 cents. Well, the gas station might have a buy 10, get your 11th free punch card, maybe Santa leaves me gift cards because he knows I love going there. The gas station attendant might be like, Beth, you spend enough money here, this one's on the house, right? I went to the same place every day. I picked the same investment strategy at the end of the year, even though I should have paid 89 cents per cup of coffee, maybe I only paid 84 cents per cup of coffee, right? Versus 
Sometimes I drink the free coffee here. Sometimes I go to Starbucks. Sometimes I go to Dunkin' Donuts. Sometimes I go to that gas station next to my house, right? So at the end of the year, because I went everywhere, the average price I paid per cup of coffee might have been $2.99. Does that make sense? So it is very, very difficult to time the market. So you could stop drinking coffee and just put all that money Or, in. yeah, even better, <laughs> yes. Stop drinking coffee and put that money in the TSP. That's actually a huge thing. The average American spends about $1,200 a year on coffee, right? You can put that into your TSP very easily. But it's gonna be very, very hard for us to time the market. I'm a financial counselor and I can't even time the market, okay? Those are like financial advisors who are on Wall Street doing day trading and they still sometimes screw it up, right? Mm -hmm. If your job in supporting the mission is you work on the flight line and you help land planes, do you want me out there doing your job? <laughs> Probably not, right? So if your job is not, you're not a financial advisor, you're probably not gonna be able to best time the market. So you're going to lose money when you're moving your money around all the time amongst the funds, okay? So what hurts my TSP? Frequent interfund transfers is just what we are talking about. Here's another thing. Did you know that you can take out a loan against your TSP? You can, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but that is going to very much so negatively impact your TSP. Military members, I need you to write down two websites. The first is my pay. This is where you go to decide what percentage you want to contribute and if you want for that contribution to go traditional or Roth. The second website you need to write down is tsp.gov and that's where you actually go to manage your investment. Okay? My civilians! Anyone been on the GRB platform? Mm -hmm. I hope you have. It's awesome. You can do so much stuff on there. You haven't been on the GRB platform. If you go to Virtual MPF or the Air Force Portal, you can get to the GRB platform. For those of you who've been around a while, it used to be called EBIS. I like this platform better. I think it's a lot more user friendly. So civilians, we are going to go to the GRB platform and that's where we're going to go to decide if we want our contributions to go traditional or Roth and how much we want to contribute. Remember those silly things called catch up contributions? They're not silly, it's awesome. Calendar year that you turn 50. Through here is also where you'll go to decide how much you want to do of catch-up contributions per month to potentially try to max out that 6,500. Second website I want for civilians to jot down is gonna be tsp.gov, and that's where we're gonna to go to actually move our money around. This is really important. Let's say that you go to tsp.gov and you log in, and you are what I lovingly refer to as my G Fund babies. Your money's been in the G Fund, hopefully only a year or two, Maybe it's been in there for 20 years. Oh, shoot. What are you going to do? Move it. Move it. Correct. <laughs> okay. So let's say that you have $10,000 in your TSP, and you want to move that from the G fund to, let's say, the life cycle fund. Now, I want to clarify, I'm a financial counselor, not an advisor, so I'm not telling you what to do with your money. This is just a hypothetical example. The first thing I'm going to want to do is an inner fund transfer. And an inner fund transfer is going to take the money in my TSP and move it to where I want it to go. Now, for those of you who have logged into TSP, the inner fund transfer and the contribution allocation look identical to one another. And a lot of times, people will do the inner fund transfer, move it to a life cycle fund, and they're like, great, I don't have to look at this again for another 30 years. Except you only did half of the process. Because if you stop at the inner fund transfer that moves the $10,000 in my account, what happens every two weeks or on the 1st and the 15th for my military members? Where does your money go every two weeks when you're putting money in the TSP? Right back into the G fund and that totally defeats the purpose of setting it and forgetting it, right? So the second thing that you'll wanna do is gonna be a contribution allocation. I can tell you about 90% of people who I work with stopped at the inner fund transfer. So that contribution allocation is gonna show where you want for your future money to go. As a general blanket statement, you probably want for your inner fund transfer and your contribution allocation to match one another. So if you're individually managing your money, right, you're logging in each year, you wanna make sure you do the inner fund transfer and the contribution allocation. If you wanna go into the life cycle fund because you, you wanna set it and forget it, you only have to do the inner fund transfer and the contribution allocation one time. 
and then from there it's going to rebalance both for you automatically. Now again, I can't tell you where to put your money, but if you're real confused about your TSP, my last name is Snodgrass, send me an email. We'll set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment to meet together. Look me up in global, elizabeth.snodgrass at us.af.mil. And in that appointment, we'll log into your TSP together and I can show you where your money is managed. I can tell you it looks like you have a low risk or a high risk. And then we can further talk about retirement planning and what your risk tolerance is. Then once you've decided what you want to happen, I can walk you through the process of doing the interfund transfer and the contribution allocation. Good deal? But don't ask me where to put it because I'm gonna smile at you and say I can't do that for you, okay? <laughs> awesome, so here's something else to think about. You can combine TSP accounts. Any of my civilians prior military? So you might have two TSP accounts. It's kind of though like when you log into your bank and you have checking and savings right one login it's just kind of two different pots of money so you can actually roll over your your military account to your civilian account if you wanted to some people want to do that just for the ease of it but if you contributed any money to a Roth TSP in a combat zone you can't roll that over so that that'll that'll sit and grow separately okay and this will probably be the the very last thing that I'm going to talk about but how do I move how do I move other money over right so maybe you're like, well, shoot, Beth, I've had an IRA for 18 years and I'm a sucker because I've been paying all those fees. First off, you're not a sucker because you might have your investment in an IRA in an option not available in the TSP. And if that's the case, keep it. However, if you want to roll something over, a Roth IRA will typically never roll over to a TSP. It's just not compatible. But a Roth 401k, traditional 401k, or a traditional IRA, you can typically roll over. How do you do it? Go to tsp.gov and print out the form TSP60. Two options with this. Well, let me rewind. TSP60 is for a traditional account. TSP60R is for a Roth account. Now, you'll, I will always recommend do a direct transfer rollover. And with the direct transfer rollover, basically I fill out that form with my 401k information on it and my TSP information and I give it to TSP. TSP reaches out to my 401k company, takes the money directly and it goes into my TSP and I never dip my hands in it. That's the safest because about 5% of the time your 401k is not compatible with your TSP. And if I take that money out of my 401k and the TSP won't take it, I am now forced to keep that money and I'm gonna lose about 30% of it due to early withdrawal penalties. When you roll it over directly, it does not count towards your annual contribution limits, right? Because I put that money in in previous years, so when I do a direct transfer rollover, it does not count towards that 19,500. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now here's something to think about. Maybe you're active duty, Maybe you're a civilian and you say, yes, the TSP is great, but I'm probably gonna go work for Verizon or Boeing or Volvo or whoever in five years. Great, as long as you have $200 in your TSP, you get to keep it for life, right? If it were me, this is what I would do. Keep my TSP, well, I'd keep my government job because we get federal holidays off, but <laughs> <laughs> let's say though I go and now, and now I'm working for Verizon, right? I'm going to contribute every two weeks to my Verizon 401k, how come? They're gonna give me matching, right? <coughs> so I still got my TSP, I can't put money in there because they'll only take federally earned dollars, but I can still log in and move my money around. I'm gonna contribute every two weeks to my Verizon 401k, get my Verizon money, and realistically, I'm not gonna be there for 20 years, that's just not how our culture is anymore. So five years later, I go and now I'm working for T-Mobile. I still have my 401k with Verizon, but I can take it because it's no longer active and at that point I can roll it over to the TSP. A lot of times when you leave federal service, companies will say, great, your TSP is compatible with our 401k and they say that to you as if you can take your TSP and roll it over to their 401k, which you can, but do you wanna do that? Maybe. I would probably though not do that and then just wait till I leave that company and then roll over their 401k to my TSP. Does that make sense? Awesome. 
Sorry, I was talking ahead. That slide's going to say that. Now, here's the last thing to keep in mind. You cannot mix traditional and Roth. So if I, if I only have money going into a Roth TSP, and let's, let's assume I'm in the high three or the CSRS, and so I'm not getting matching. If I'm only putting money into the Roth, but I have a <coughs> traditional 401k, I can't roll that over. Super easy, put 1% into a traditional, just for one pay period, now you have a traditional TSP. But if you're putting your money into a Roth TSP, and you're getting the government agency math going into a traditional TSP, you'll be good to go. Does that make sense? Wow, you guys have been great. So I crammed in about 90 minutes into like 50-ish. <laughs> so you guys have been great. I hope I didn't lose anyone around uh, along the way. If you're thinking about taking out a loan against your TSP, I want you to come and have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me. Because when you take out the loan against your TSP, you pay yourself back at the interest rate of the G fund, which at first seems really attractive, right? But if I took $50,000 out of my TSP and it's going to take me 10 years to repay it, I probably just missed out on a lot of compound interest on $50,000. And what if it was last year where I got a 23% return rate? A lot of times, we'll sit down and I'll crunch the numbers for you and I will not tell you what to do and I will not judge you. Whatever you decide is best for you, I support. But we'll run the numbers. What's the long-term cost of you taking out that loan with the bank, even at a 13% interest rate, versus taking out that loan against, against your TSP? And we'll see which one gives you truly the most bang for the buck. Good deal? Awesome. So I've still got a couple of minutes. What questions do you guys have for me? Is it true that you can only take out, once you reach 59 and a half, you can only take out withdraw one lump sum one time? Oh, the 59 and a half. That's a good age. That's a good question. So if you are under 59 and a half, you are able to take out a, a one time hardship withdrawal. However, once you're 59 and a half, that money is yours to touch. So you could still be working part time or whatnot and take out, you know, 200 bucks a month set up as a it's not an allotment, but, but basically the TSP, you would set it up for TSP to give you 200 bucks a month or 1500 bucks a month. Um, but once you're 59 and a half, you can do it. It's your money. Now it's taxable income though. So I had somebody at the last TSP workshop who was like, well, I've got about $300,000 I want to take out of there and put into an indifferent investment. I support that. However, be smart, you might need to time it where you take out like $50,000 a year, because what happens is if I take out that full $300,000 and it's in a traditional TSP, you're gonna get like 100 bucks at the end of the day after you pay out, it's gonna be more than that, but you'll lose over 50% of it to taxes, because you have to pay federal taxes, state taxes, social security and Medicare taxes, that answer your question? You don't have to do that if you roll it over into something else though, right? Take it out and put it into something else. So if I take it out and I want to put it into a midterm <clears throat> level investment, I would have to pay taxes. If I'm, let me rewind. If I'm 59 and a half, I can take it out without losing 30% of it. However, it still counts as taxable income if it comes from a traditional. So if I take out $50,000 because I want to put it into a midterm level investment, I have to pay taxes on it. But if I want to roll it over to an IRA because I want to work with this financial advisor, if I do a rollover, it does, I don't have to pay taxes on it until I'm actually with, withdrawing it. Did that clarify? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Can, can you have a traditional TSP and a Roth TSP? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So. Uh, when you log in, it's all, it's all going to look like it's one pot of money. You manage it all the same but the government and the TSP is keeping track of what's in what pot. Your end of year statement should tell you what's traditional and what's Roth, which you should have received a couple weeks ago.